No time to prepare this, of course. It only dropped in the last 60 minutes. But the last 60 minutes of reading it are enough to make your hair stand on end. We'll talk about who's not in it and who is in it. That paragon of virtue, Tony Blair and his missus, Cherry, are in the mire in it. Uh, the social democrat, the centrist, the guiding mind, indeed guiding hand of Keir Starmer's Labour Party is revealed therein to have purchased a £6.5 million property in the Marylebone Road in London to house Mrs Blair's legal practice, but they had absolutely no idea uh, that they bought it from a minister in the tyrannical government of Bahrain. That's right, uh, the erstwhile Middle East peace envoy, the man who earns nine million a year from the Saudi kleptocrat tyranny, the man who has befriended every Gulf potentate ever seen on the planet, had absolutely no idea that he was buying this property from a Bahraini thief. Because all of the royal families of all of these tyrannies did not get as rich as they are by legitimate means. He bought the company, not the property. He bought it offshore, as you do. And it's purely a coincidence that thereby he avoided paying over £300,000 in tax to the British Exchequer by purchasing this property this way. £312,000 to be precise. There is no suggestion, as The Guardian puts it, uh, that the Blairs knowingly carried out this sordid manoeuvre with any view to saving on their tax bill and reducing their more than £100 million personal fortunes. Oh no, that would be entirely unworthy. Neither is it suggested that Mr Blair or the Bahraini oligarch had any knowledge of each other's existence in this transaction. And if you believe any of that, I have a bridge here in London that I can sell you going cheaply. The property portfolio of the King of Jordan is not going cheaply. In fact, $100 million would not buy it. All the while, his countrymen and women groaning under the yoke of millions of refugees and uh, an economy headed south. Not to mention Jerusalem, over which he has a spiritual authority. Not to mention the Palestinian people over the very thin river uh, that divides the two territories. Oh no, it was more important to sink a hundred million dollars into Malibu. As you do, Malibu. What's not to love? Mind you, the Aliyev tyranny in Azerbaijan has done exceedingly well considering how little time the family has been in power. They are revealed in Pandora's box to have purchased offshore a 400 million pound property empire here in London town. Yes, they even sold a part of it to Her Majesty the Queen. Yes, the Crown Estates paid 67 million pounds offshore to buy a property from an oligarch whose name has become a byword 
for corruption and other brutalities against the people of his own country and indeed his neighbors. There's so much to unpick. I'm trying to get someone who will help me unpick it. But if I don't, we'll return to this subject in the final hour with the redoubtable James Giles. There's one person who's not in the Pandora's box. And that is President Vladimir Putin of Russia. The president of the Czech Republic's in it. He bought a 22 million euro chateau in France offshore. Well, as you do when you're the president of the Czech Republic. And there are many, many others. We don't care what the rich do, more fool us for allowing them to do it. The problem is the politicians, the politicians who rule us and who could do something about it, who are revealed to be up to their necks, wallowing in the trough of often ill-gotten gains. Putin's not in it. Yes, he is, said a good friend of mine not 15 minutes ago. I saw his picture on the BBC website. He must be in it. He's not in it. I saw his picture. You were meant to see his picture. His picture is in it, but he isn't in it. There are two Russians in it. One of them is described uh, by the scribe in The Guardian as having been allegedly, romantically linked to Putin in the 1990s. And the other is somebody who's dead and who is again allegedly on friendly terms with Putin, but Putin ain't in it. Many other Russian oligarchs, usually another word for thief, are in it, including the owner of the London Evening Standard, a Mr. Lebedev, whose son attended my wedding. You could tell there was only one billionaire present because he was the only one wearing jeans who didn't bring a wedding present or even a card of congratulations. His father owns the Evening Standard and London Live Television, has extensive interests in Hollywood and fled Russia in 2016, having been accused of embezzling a huge amount of the people's money. There are Russians by the baker's dozen in the Pandora's box, but they have all one thing in common. They are Russians living in exile from Russia, not least because over the last 20 years, Putin has been trying, not hard enough in my view, not firmly enough, in my view, has been trying to get a handle on the oligarchs and get some, if not all, of their money back. We'll be talking about corruption of a different kind in a minute or two with Roger Waters, the mind and the inspiration behind the wonderful Pink Floyd. Roger Waters, like this show, is a friend of Stephen Donziger. Regular viewers and listeners already know that Stephen has spent uh, the last two years and more under house arrest in New York City at the behest of an oil company who've taken a private legal action against him, nothing to do with the justice system, not endorsed by the Attorney General of the United States, an oil company operating its own justice system and able to place someone under house arrest for exposing their crimes 
against the people in Ecuador. Well, they've gone one better this week because Stephen Donziger will not be watching the show this evening because he's behind bars in an actual prison as a result of a private legal action taken by an oil company seeking to avoid paying for the devastating human and environmental disaster that its activities in a poor third world country have caused. You really couldn't make that story up. It's no wonder that the friend of liberty, Roger Waters, has been drawn to that story. Don't forget that Julian Assange himself, another mutual friend of this show and Roger Waters, will shortly be on trial effectively for his life because as the original judge found in his case, the risk of Julian Assange committing suicide if sent to the internal Guantanamo Bay in Colorado, USA, was so great that she could not in conscience countenance extraditing him to the United States. Since when a tsunami of filthy odor worthy of Chevron itself, has flowed over this case. It is utterly bankrupt. Sordid doesn't come near it. But there's still a chance that an English court will send Julian Assange to that Guantanamo after all. Now, as it happens, I know a very great deal about Lord Louis Mountbatten. With my interest in India and Pakistan, you might expect that. I have studied, not academically, but studied as a layman, uh, the labyrinthine events and negotiations uh, that took place in the run-up to and in the aftermath of the partition of India and Pakistan. It was not long before I was born that it all took place. To describe Lord Louis Mountbatten as a filthy pervert who would make Prince Andrew look like a Boy Scout, if he had been a Boy Scout, Lord Louis Mountbatten would have had him in his bed, at least according to the FBI, who cautioned the United States government to have nothing to do with Mountbatten because of his perverted appetites for young girls and young boys. In fact, there was scarcely anything with a pulse that Mountbatten would not enter, oftentimes several at a time. Mountbatten was a national disgrace, and yet to the British people, he continues to be presented as a polished adornment to the British royal family. Well, I know standards have slipped in British royalty, but it's time to drum Lord Mountbatten out of the pantheon. We'll be talking to a man, Andrew Lowney, an author who has considerably enhanced my knowledge of these matters later in the show. And we'll be talking in addition to James Giles, to the coolest of American commentators, Garland Nixon. It's all coming up. 